Hello. Hello, everyone. My talk will be not so technical like Ingvar's, but I think it will be interesting. Uh, the plan is we will talk about a little bit about what WAGA is and what problems it solves. Uh, then we will talk about challenges, uh, about uh, uh, some Rust challenges and also container things that we had to solve. Then we will talk a little bit about uh, libraries that we have done in the process of doing Vaga, of um, coding Vaga. And uh, if we have some time, we will talk about uh, deployment tools which uh, complement Vaga itself. So what is Vaga? Uh, it turns out it's hard to describe, so I have prepared a few descriptions. Uh, the first one is uh, VN for NVM or RVM on steroids. Who knows what VN is? Okay, we see Python guys. Who knows what uh, NVM is? Uh, almost same number of people. And RVM? Okay. That was fun. So we have we do a little bit more than these tools because we can install an operating system like kind of operating system in container, uh, actually a Linux distribution, because we need all the things like Image Magic, which is a command line tool or C library to uh, convert images and do other crazy stuff with images. Uh, and uh, for some reason we need a make tool and we just install uh, all the dependencies from package.json into a container. Uh, and also we have uh, a thing similar in some sense to scripts in package.json. Um, we can define the commands in YAML file to run different commands with some predefined uh, command line, uh, and uh, as you can see, we can run things in different containers, some with JavaScript dependencies and some in Python dependencies with all the settings like environment. And uh, the cool thing is we can just clone some random repository, uh, just go into the directory and uh, type vaga, and it shows all the things you can do with, contain, with that project. Uh, in this case, we can build uh, static JavaScript files, maybe not just JavaScript, maybe CSS files or images or SVG images, whatever stuff that author of this repository wanted to build. Then we have a command to run. This just runs whatever stuff needed to run the applications. And also, for some reason, this example shows build docs. Usually, it's just Vaga doc to build all the documentation. And it doesn't matter uh, for new user of your project whether it's building cargo doc or like Sphinx or whatever documentation tools this project has. So you just type, for example, Vaga build, and it works. Even more. If you do git pull and some configuration changes, like you added a new dependency to package.json or to Python's requirements txt, or you change it to nginx config, whatever, you just type waga run, and everything that needs to be rebuilt is rebuilt. Everything that doesn't change it just runs as is. Uh, about changes, I mean when uh, dependencies of the container change, not your actual code. Of course, every time you run uh, some command like in Python, your new code is, appears, but if you uh, change dependencies, uh, Vaga runs just rebuilds, uh, that, uh, rebuilds uh, containers which need to be rebuilt, which has changed dependencies. Also, we call Vaga a high-level package manager because it can install not just like a package for Python, but also package for Python, NPM, 
uh, Ruby and PHP, uh, and whatever, uh, of course, Rust. Um, but for Rust, we have no special comments because for Rust, the installing dependencies is easy um, out of the box. Uh, and you can combine all these package managers in one container and you can split them up into different containers. Uh, sometimes you can build uh, some artifacts as part of container and put them into another. Uh, in this example, we built uh, some JavaScript static files and put them to the container that has Nginx. The resulting container has only Nginx and uh, build JavaScript files, so it has no node modules, no other dependencies that JavaScript depends on. So it's quite small. Uh, this kind of container is, isn't needed for development. Usually uh, we use it only for deployment, but it's just an example. Uh, Another high-level thing is that we can build commands that depend on other commands. In this case, we have a make.js command that is run into a container having node modules and not installed. And then we run some program which uh, just runs Rust program, which again has no node modules and you can test some stuff uh, built in another container this way. Uh, and also we have another high level feature. We can run multiple processes supervised by Vaga, uh, again in different containers. And um, the point here is you can't uh, supervise uh, multiple processes in Bash reliably. Because in Shell you have a lot of things like run this in background, a lot of job control and other things, but nothing guarantees that if you uh, type control C that all demons that Shell had just run uh, that they will be shut down. You usually have some detached demons somewhere and you need to kill them manually and, and so on. Vaga solves that problem. And we also call Vaga a containerization tool without demons. Uh, it, it, there are two senses, of course, in, uh, in this statement, but I will talk about technical one. So usually when you run something with Vaga, you have, you, you, Vaga spawns uh, these processes directly. If we compare this with Docker, uh, we can see that in Docker, uh, uh, Docker client sends the job to the Docker daemon. It's actually old Docker process tree because it shows that Docker daemon runs your process. Actually, now there are a lot more stuff like container D, run C, and so on. But basically, the tree is the same. Uh, we have a root user that runs Docker, that runs uh, root user of the trans container D is a trans run C, if I remember correctly, and your process. Uh, in Vaga case, uh, we have just two intermediate Vaga processes. I will tell you a little bit more about that. And your process. So if you type control C of e or if you um, cancel the bash session by some other means, it just stops all the processes. So, wrapping up about Vaga, it has simple YAML config, it has some versioning, so you don't need manually to check whether you need to run npm install. Uh, I think you used to it in, in Cargo. Cargo does um, all the dependency checks by itself, but not for C libraries. Uh, Vaga does it for everything, like it tries to do it for everything. It uses user namespaces, so you don't need any uh, privileged scene like Docker is to run it. And it has multiple process monitoring. Uh, 
everything uh, that Vaga does, it does only for dev environment. You never run Vaga in production, but you can build uh, containers with all the same version features and deploy them to production. So, some challenges we had. Uh, so, do you know what the fork is or clone is the system called fork? Okay, uh, so basically uh, fork and uh, clone is uh, actually implementation of fork with uh, more parameters. Uh, when process is forked, it's in some state when you can define uh, the state of your future process. But um, you must be very careful with uh, much of the things like you can do any memory allocations, but you actually need to do a lot of stuff like close file descriptors, like setup, um, some parameters for process. Um, sometimes you create a pipe, sometimes you do other interesting things. So one of the bugs we had actually, uh, yeah, so recently appeared uh, before exec hook on the command. Uh, the CMD here is std process command. Uh, when you uh, call a function before exec, uh, it um, called uh, after fork but before exec. So in the same state when you can't do any memory allocations. And uh, like one of the bugs was if you iterate over the hash map uh, in debug mode, it crashes. I don't remember correctly if it's because of memory allocations or stack size or whatever, but we had uh, running um, uh, another our supervisor, I will talk about it a little bit more in production for, I think, a half of year in release mode, and it worked, worked well. And uh, in debug mode, it just crashed immediately. Uh, so actually, we, we changed uh, hash map to a vector because we iterate over it. We don't need a hash map uh, in, uh, in this mode after fork. And it worked. So. The key here is that we, um, in Rust, usually don't care too much about allocations and rely on the uh, compiler to do all sorts of the optimizations. But sometimes uh, you need to know exactly how Rust works in details. Uh, another good thing about Rust is that it uh, sets clawexec flag uh, by default on all files. Who knows what clawexec is? Uh, okay. So when you open a file in Unix system, it creates a file descriptor with which just a number for the operating system to access different file-related functions. Uh, and usually, for some very early historical reasons, these file descriptors are uh, inherited uh, when you exec another binary. And it is a large security problem because uh, some file descriptors may access uh, some like privileged things uh, and uh, just files that a child process shouldn't write. Um, and uh, by default, Rust sets the close exec flag, which means on every exec, just close that file descriptor. Uh, in C and in many other languages, it's not by default. So every time you spawn a new process, you just close every every file descriptor that could possibly be open. Like we count just from one to 10,000 to close file descriptors. Uh, so the good thing that uh, Rust has that by default, we change the four file descriptors which we want to propagate to child processes, such as pipes to communicate to the process. We explicitly 
um, we explicitly reset that flag after fork. Um, so another issue, it's not exactly, what, um, it's not trust related, but it's about containers. Uh, the point is when we create a, a container, basically a PID namespace, um, I will not see you, uh, m many details about namespaces and containers, but anyway, so uh, first process that spawned it in container, uh, it has a different set of defaults for signals, uh, which means if you don't catch, for example, term signal or uh, interrupt signal, uh, your process just ignores that thing. Like if you type control C on any interactive things that run by Docker, it usually just ignores the signal. Uh, so in Vaga, we just have um, init system by d uh, uh, like init process. It's not exactly init process, but process which has PID one in container. Uh, is uh, Vaga itself, uh, so it does a good job about reparenting uh, processes, signals, and other things. In Docker, it arrived just recently, and you need to install tiny or some other uh, init command into container itself. In Vaga, we don't do this because I think it's like, I don't know why we need that if we can just provide a process by Vaga itself. Um, we had a lot of open, oh, sorry, a lot of operating system issues uh, because when we started uh, doing Vaga, uh, user namespaces were very, very recently appeared. And uh, there are a lot of undocumented, still undocumented stuff, like PID1 uh, issues that I uh, explained before. I think uh, Vaga's page that was describing PID1 issues wa was one of the first ones on the internet. Uh, we had a lot of issues about user spaces and mount points and other things. Uh, sometimes we needed even to go to the kernel source, look at the error codes that uh, kernel returns, and guess which if statement we had, like we, we couldn't, uh, uh, couldn't pass. Uh, it was like some quest or something. Uh, because uh, like if you do mount something like mount bind A to B, operating system returns like invalid value or permission denied. And you don't need know what permission is denied. Like you are root user and what, what permission denied? Um, yeah. And uh, basically, most of the things are still undocumented. Uh, honestly, we just passed them in Vaga, and now we can we, we know how to do things. We can look at it if something's wrong. Uh, okay, and we had a lot of Linux distribution issues. Uh, like every script uh, e uh, that installs operation system things that it can make devices in slash dev for some reason. Uh, it, it thinks that it, it's uh, like root user. Uh, actually in container it is root user, but it can do some things like very privileged ones like mcannot. Uh, we conflicted with audit system of the host system. I don't know what it is and how it works, but uh, it turned out that in old Ubuntu it doesn't work well with user namespaces. In recent systems it work well, works well. Uh, sometimes um, like Ubuntu broke our 
installation process by removing a local GAN package recently. I don't know, like uh, um, DPKG uh, always runs, I think, maybe not always, m maybe almost always la runs local GAN after installation of every package or first package, I don't know. And Ubuntu just removed the package and said, oh, okay, nobody needs it. Um, so there are unreliable mirrors like uh, Alpine mirrors are small, but they remove old versions of uh, the repositories from mirrors and that has uh, tons of problems. We can't support our own mirror for images and for packages, so this like uh, our ma major pain uh, for supporting Vaga, not like syscalls and container stuff and other things, which was very, very surprising to me. And, okay, we have time. So we'll talk a little bit more about Rust libraries we've done. First, we have unshare crate. Unshare is a syscall that uh, starts namespaces. Uh, we can uh, make a namespace with unshare call and clone call. In fact, we use only clone uh, most of the time, but there is a um, Unix utility, Linux utility called unshare, and we call create unshare just um, because it's similar. So basically it looks like this. This code works both with unshare create and uh, with uh, std, command, uh, std process command. Uh, you just uh, create a binary, add args, and uh, the status method runs the um, command itself and returns uh, whatever command returns the status. Uh, so we just added another method like unshare these namespaces. Uh, there are four namespaces here, like network, user, UTS is about host name and mount namespaces about, about file system. Uh, we have trudir, like uh, makes this um, part of file system the new root for the new process. We have uh, set uh, UID maps. It uh, maps uh, users in host system to users in uh, container, uh, user IDs and group IDs. Uh, actually, we have much more stuff. Uh, this example just shows that it's pretty similar to what we have in standard library, but with extension things. We couldn't make an extension trade here because it doesn't work that well, but we, we just made a similar, very similar interface. Uh, we also have um, here the um, helper to, uh, to make uh, actually supervisors. Um, it processes zombies. Who know what the zombie process is? Okay, most of the room. So, um, Rust doesn't provide this thing out of the box because you can just run a command and uh, get status and uh, this exact command will be process as well, but if you are writing PID1, uh, I mean supervisor, you need to process zombies too. Also, we don't allow um, demonizing processes by default, because I think it's also old stuff in Unix, like if your child processes, if parent process uh, that your child got uh, to be reparented to init, to, to PID1 process. And it only useful for certain things like for making daemons. 
And even for now, even for system stuff like running a web server or running whatever thing, you, you don't run it directly in Demonize. You run it with systemd or upstart or launchd uh, by supervisor itself. So you, you don't run it yourself, you command to uh, system daemon to run it. So by default, we don't demonize. And that's it for the share crate. And we have also an utility for making mount points easy. It looks like this. You just say what you want to mount, and uh, we have uh, strongly typed all the parameters. The um, important thing about this crate, uh, and like not very important, but it just common Rust quirk. Uh, if we uh, uh, do something like this, we, we want just to create a bind mount point. Like uh, bind uh, does alias in a folder Y for the folder X, uh, folder X. Uh, usually you want to report some nice error. Uh, and you do format, all that stuff, it's quite good. Uh, it's long, but maybe good enough. Y you can see, like, can mind x to y, no such file or directory. What directory uh, is non-existing? Actually, any of them. Uh, so, what we done, oh, okay, so, here is bare mount. It means just call the mount syscall and return IO error. And if you call mount, uh, you skip all the formatting things and you get nice error. Like, okay, we, we couldn't mount. We have auth error like no such file or directory. And then we check if Source target source directory exists or target directory exists, and we also show that mount bind was run by super user. Um, so that's about our reporting. Some short to do list uh, because uh, we had uh, not much tools in Rust when we started. We use a uh, busy box. Uh, for doing some system level stuff. We stopped use it, using it for unpacking packages a few versions ago. Now we, we also want to use Tokyo to download files instead of just busybox busy wget. Um, I think Tokyo um, ecosystem is already ready for that, but we had no time to implement actually to integrate it. Also, we have some network stuff. Uh, mostly, it, it used not, f uh, uh, we don't use network stuff in Vaga every day, but we use it for testing some network distribution things, like we can uh, spawn two containers and um, break, um, break connection between them and see how software reacts to this stuff. Uh, for all that network uh, things, we use uh, IP and IP tables and bridge control from the busy box. Uh, in fact, we want them all to be re-implemented in Rust just to have less dependencies on the external things. Like we now bundle busy box as part of the Vagas installation. Uh, Okay, that was short to do. We have time. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about deployment. Um, everybody asks, so okay, Vaga is great. How to deploy it? And we have some tools. I would say they are not ready for production like for, for everyone. We are running them in production for almost a year, but uh, it's easy because they are our tools. So 
Litos does container stuff. It uses the same crates as Vaga, uh, but basically it's very simple supervisor. It doesn't do you know, like Docker pool, you know, downloading images, whatever crazy stuff. It's very simple. It's 5K lines of code, but mostly because uh, there are a lot of things in configuration to handle. It would be even more simple if there were no configuration. <laughs> like, uh, and the core thing about Lizos is that it handles some security limitations. I don't have time to speak about that a lot. Uh, so we have control, uh, which does monitoring, decentralize it. Um, this is needed because to schedule, to, to do some scheduling, um, you need to have a reliable source of metrics, um, and it's very fast. Uh, the interesting thing about it is that it doesn't really work in uh, debugging build because it's, it occupies 100% CPU and uh, can't even scan all the metrics uh, timely. And in release mode, it just uses like 1% CPU. Um, basically, that's it. It also provides aggregated metric for cluster-wide scheduling uh, in, in a way where you still don't need a central server. You can ask actually any control instance uh, for the metrics. And we have a cluster-wide scheduling. It's uh, kind of the same like, I don't know, I can't compare with Kubernetes uh, because Kubernetes has, is set of a lot of tools, uh, and it does uh, like all the work needed on top of Cantal and Litos, uh, and it's scriptable with Lua code, and that's it. Probably we don't have time for questions. Thank you.